Malatesta seemed trapped, stuck on a prison colony, seemingly with no recourse, and facing a government acting even more violently than before. One thing that's clear, however, is that he doesn't give up very easily, and as fate turned out, he wouldn't be on this island for long. He's transferred to the island of Ustica de Lampedusa. The goal was to make escape harder, but this had the opposite effect. While Lampedusa was farther away from any inhabited settlement, it was also farther away from the oversight of the Italian government. This, as it turned out, would backfire tremendously. In an incident similar to his time back in Trani all the way in 1874, he befriended the director of the colony who quickly became sympathetic towards him and many of the other political prisoners. He allowed them to travel throughout the colony with less and less supervision, and began to allow letters to flow freely to the mainland. In one kind of funny instance, he wrote a direct reply to a few socialists who wanted to vote him into public office to free him from prison, outraged at the idea that he'd never want to be in the government. As you can tell, just like Latrani in 1874, the prison didn't exactly hold him for very long. On May 9th, 1899, in the dead of night, he and a comrade from Florence hopped on a fishing boat and left. He returned to his foreign home on Islington High Street, but he didn't stay in London for all that long. Pedro Estev, an old Spanish comrade, had invited Malatesta to come to Patterson, New Jersey. Some of you might recognize that name, as it was a famous hotspot for anarchism during the 19th and 20th centuries. Hundreds of anarchist immigrants flocked to the city, including some famous names like Pietro Gori, Luigi Galliani, Carlo Tresca, and Johann Most. On arrival, there was a bizarre situation. La Question Social, Malatesta's most popular paper, was already being published in Patterson. One problem though, Malatesta had absolutely no connection and had never been to the United States before this. As it turns out, an anarchist group called The Right to Exist started up in 1895, and in a bizarre twist of fate, it was, since at least 1898, being edited by Giuseppe Ciancapelli. For those who don't remember, he was a previous socialist editor at Avanti who had become an anarchist after an interview with Malatesta. In an even more bizarre situation, despite his socialist past, Ciancabelli had become a devoted anti-organizationalist anarchist, in stark contrast to Malatesta's very pro-organization approach. Even even more bizarre, the group itself was still pro-organizationalist. So when Malatesta arrived, he found out that a group following his ideas was publishing his paper, edited by someone who's opposed to his ideas, but is still editing his paper on behalf of the group. As you can imagine, the arrival of the person they were imitating threw this weird balance into disarray. And eventually, Ciancabelli left the group to edit his own paper, La Rola. Malatesta eventually became the editor of La Question Sociale, continuing where he left off with La Gettazione back in Ancana. Eventually, multiple debates were set back and forth between La Question Sociale and La Rola, as this very quickly grew to become a battleground between the organizationalist and anti-organizationalist anarchists. Ciancabia, from what I can find, was a very respectable and reasonable man. His arguments with Malatesta rested on his distrust of formal organizations being able to keep anarchist principles intact. He argued with civility, and had multiple very productive back and forths with Malatesta. However, there was one person who, to say the least, was not as reasonable. That person was Domenico Pazaglia. If you recognize that name, you probably know what's about to happen. Malatesta, during his debate with Ciancabia, held a speech in West Hoboken, which was a hotspot for anti-organizationalist anarchism and the place where Loorla was being published. Basaglia, to say the least, did not like this. He was a bit of an outcast, even in his own circle, but that didn't mean he wasn't going to try and make a stand. So the Zucca Saloon, on September 3rd, Basaglia concluded that the only reasonable solution was to shoot Malatesta. He fired a shot, which according to different accounts either grazed his leg or missed him entirely, but Basaglia wasn't deterred and tried again. However, he was quickly disarmed by no other than Gaetano Bresci. Basaglia then promptly fled the scene before falling back into obscurity. The police arrived at the scene, and in proper police fashion, decided to arrest Malatesta. Despite this, Malatesta refused to say who shot him and was released shortly after. Rather than sensationalize the story any further, Malatesta decided not to publish what had happened in his paper. Instead, he continued writing the usual counters to La Ola as if nothing happened. Don't, however, let this incident reflect too badly on Shankapia or the other anti-organizationalists. Regardless of their theoretical disputes, Shankabia still remained another fighter for freedom and liberation and had nothing to do with the assassination attempt. He continued to publish La Rola, but facing government persecution after the assassination of McKinley, he was forced to San Francisco. He continued publishing there before dying tragically in 1904, only 32 years old. I'll put the ending to his Against Organization, authored by him, in respect for a life cut too short. Quote, 
We do not oppose the organizers. They will continue, if they like, in their tactics. If, as I think, it will not do any great good, it will not do any great harm either. But it seems to me that they have writhed, throwing their cry of alarm and blacklisting us as either savages or as theoretical dreamers. Malatesta stayed in America for a few more months, but shortly returned to London for what Fabry claims are personal reasons. However, he wouldn't have much time to rest before shots rang out that were heard across all of Europe. Gaetano Bresci, following the brutal Beva Bagatelis massacre where the King of Italy congratulated a general who shot dead nearly 400 protesters, decided to do the unthinkable. He returned to his homeland of Italy with only a revolver and a few personal belongings. On July 29th, he did what Giovanni Bassinante couldn't. He shot dead the King of Italy. This event sent shockwaves throughout all of Europe, perhaps the most prominent assassination since when Tsar Alexander II was gunned down in 1881. The trial became a massive spectacle. Saverio Merlino led Brescia's defense, and the event became a massive rallying cry for anarchists throughout the whole world. Unfortunately, it was also used to justify massive repression. Italy especially became extremely treacherous. Malatesta wrote an article about the whole incident. Apparently, after the king's death, thousands of republicans, liberals, etc. had a sudden outpouring of sympathy for Umberto I. Politicians and prominent figures of all sorts suddenly became the king's best friend, writing long and sanctimonious rants about the king's awe-inspiring kindness and the barbarity of the anarchists. Malatesta, to say the least, got fed up with the constant stupid shows of sympathy and wrote an article of his own to combat it. He pointed out how the king directly led to the arbitrary arrests of hundreds, and in his most egregious act, was actively complicit in a massacre leaving hundreds dead and hundreds more wounded. He concluded, saying that the assassination was the only logical effect of the king's bloody tyranny. He continued after this to do his usual activities. However, work gradually began to take up more and more of his time. He worked as a mechanic in the day and taught Italian at night, which gave him very little time for much else. Still, he used any spare time he could in both the advance of his own personal pursuits as well as the movement in general. He continued writing pamphlets and articles whenever possible. This continued without major interruption or notable event until 1906. For years before then, the syndicalist movement grew more and more in France. It was now reaching the heights of its power. They had, until then, been mostly building up, but finally reaching the strength to organize mass movements, Malatesta hoped they would take advantage of the growing influence. In particular, he hoped that from May Day in 1906, they would campaign directly for an 8-hour workday, utilizing their massive platform to strike directly rather than just holding a rally. He arrived secretly in Paris, and with a few others began trying to rally the unions to action. However, the unions ultimately did nothing. This is one of the first disappointments that made him realize that syndicalism had to be balanced. It seemed like the syndicates were willing to build up, to organize, to gain the support amongst the working class, but were utterly paralyzed when it came to the actual moment of action. Over the course of the year, he noticed a growing trend of people believing that a general strike could completely replace revolution. The problem of a decade ago, where anarchists adopted solely insurrectionary tactics and risked complete isolation from the workers' movement, had been gradually reversed. Back then, the problem was that anarchists were willing to throw down their lives in useless pursuits willing to face execution but not willing to organize mass movements. Now, the issue is that nobody was willing to take a stand when the government started playing dirty. Quote, In the early days, when they talked about the general strike for the first time, every man had his own rifle and revolver, his plan of the town, of the forts, arsenals, prisons, government buildings, and so forth. Nowadays, nobody thinks of these things and yet talk glibly about revolution. Look at what happened in southern Italy. The government shot down peasants by the hundreds, and the only soldier that was hurt fell off his horse by accident. To Malatesta, syndicalism began to face many of the same challenges that the reformers such as Costa faced a few decades earlier, a widening support base, but with the risk of total de-radicalization in the process. He wrote an article in 1907 which very eloquently articulates this, called Anarchism and Syndicalism. In it, he elaborates on his position that anarchists must remain anarchists first and foremost. A union, even if conducted along non-hierarchical lines, is not an inherently anarchist institution. In fact, it can very often fall victim to the same paralyzing forces that political parties do. Unless constantly monitored and checked, it can become a tool of power like any other. As he says in the article, quote, Thus, 
one can see developing in all unions that have reached a certain position of influence, a tendency to assure and accord rather than against the masters, a privileged situation for themselves, and so create difficulties of entrance for new members and for the admission of apprentices in the factory, a tendency to amass large funds that are afterwards they are afraid of compromising, to seek the favor of public powers, to be absorbed, above all, in cooperation and mutual benefit schemes, and to become, at last, conservative elements in society. Because of this, to him, anarchism still needs to be the core of any movement trying to truly achieve emancipation. As he puts, quote, It seems clear to me that the syndicalist movement cannot replace the anarchist movement, and that it can serve as a means of education and of revolutionary preparation only if it is acted on by anarchist impulse, action, and criticism. Anarchists, then, ought to abstain themselves from identifying with the syndicalist movement, and to consider as an aim that which is but one of the many means of propaganda and action that they can utilize. This doesn't mean he thinks anarchists shouldn't work with unions. Instead, he advocates for a diversity of tactics. As he says shortly after in the article, anarchists, quote, should remain in the syndicates as elements given an onward impulse and strive to make of them as much as possible instruments of combat in view of the social revolution. They should work to develop in the syndicates all that which can augment its educative influence and its combativeness, the propaganda of ideas, the forcible strike, the spirit of proselytism, the disgust and hatred of the authorities and of the politicians, the practice of solidarity towards individuals and groups in conflict with the masters. They should combat all which tends to render them egoistic, pacifistic, and conservative. On these conditions, the participation of anarchists in the labor movement will have good results, but only on these conditions. He does recognize the innumerable benefits that unions, even once contrary to anarchist goals, can immediately give the workers. He recognizes their power to bring reform, but he challenges the claim that we should sacrifice our future for illusionary and temporary goals. Gains, which will, if nothing else changes, inevitably be lost. Quote, These tactics will sometimes appear to be, and even may really be, hurtful to the immediate interests of some groups, but that does not matter when it is a question of the anarchist cause, that is to say, of the general and permanent interests of humanity. We certainly wish, while waiting for the revolution, to wrestle from the governments as much liberty and well-being as possible, but we would not compromise the future for some momentary advantages, which besides are often illusory or gained at the expense of other workers. He then ends with a really great passage that really gets to the core of his point. One I'll just quote directly. Let us beware of ourselves. The error of having abandoned the labor movement has done an immense injury to anarchism, but at least it leaves an altered and distinctive character. The error of confounding the anarchist movement with trade unionism would still be more grave. That will happen to us which had happened to the social democrats as soon as they went into the parliamentary struggle. They gained a numerical force, but by coming each day less socialist. We would also become more numerous, but we should cease to be anarchist. He continued his writings and activism throughout this time, taking a major part in the 1907 Amsterdam conference. He always remained enthusiastic and energetic, but greater and greater challenges began to mount. Come ti chiami? Ve l'ho già detto, ripeti ancora, non ho capito. 1910 was when Malatesta's age began to really show. He was 57 by this time, and his enthusiasm couldn't always help him. He suffered from chronic lung problems throughout all of this, which combined with his hazardous work and old age put him at great risk. Despite him nearing 60, he still worked from morning to sunset in dark and freezing London houses, crawling through ducts and passages in his job as a mechanic and electrician. He suffered multiple bronchitis attacks, even more than before. He was lucky that Emilia and Giovanni Defendi were still always there to take care of However, as the passage of time marched on, more and more people he once knew intimately began to die. Pietro Gori died in 1911, at the cursed age of 45. With it, the Italian movement's musician, poet, and unwavering revolutionary was gone. At least Recluse, a good friend of Malatesta throughout his years in exile, had also died. But a death that may be symbolically the most important was the death of Andrea Costa in 1910. The old alliance had been fractured beyond repair a long time ago, but the death of Costa had finally buried it. And in fact, it's even a bit shocking to me, by this point it's been over 20 years since the death of Cafiero, with the passage of time not quite numbing the shock of it. It's been nearly 30 years since the defection of Andrea Costa, which broke one of the last remaining chains of the alliance, and it's been even longer since the death of Bakunin, the man where the seemingly inseparable group had its origin. In the nearly 40 years that had passed since Malatesta first joined the movement, a time dotted with exile and prison, almost everything had changed. All of his mentors and old comrades were seemingly gone. Malatesta was truly one of the few of that generation left. Like I've said, Malatesta never wrote his memoirs or revealed too much about his personal life. His thoughts, though speculation can arise, remain unknown, 
but one thing that we could see is his actions. And even though it had become increasingly clear that he was maybe of a dying breed, and even his age left its mark on him, he never felt his cynicism and despair. He simply didn't have that luxury. Instead, he continued to fight, continued on until his body gave out. And even though 1910 was undoubtedly a tough time, it is nowhere near the end for him. So far, the old revolutionary, standing with a new group of friends and allies, marches on. An opportunity for action eventually presented itself. In 1911, the outbreak of the Tripolitanian War created a revived interest in socialism and anarchism. In the Italian government's attempts to bolster a militarist fervor, they instead revealed their cruelty. A new wave of popular movements crashed out Italy, reviving the seemingly waning movements of the time. They made multiple articles condemning the war, trying to rally the Italian people to his side. He wasn't, however, just satisfied with the writing. In 1912, he made his plans to finally return to Italy after so many years of exile. He began preparations, and those in Italy waited with excited breath. By this point, he was increasingly becoming an almost mythical figure in Italy, helped by his long stays in exile and by his definitive and revolutionary acts whenever he could return. He was a welcome change to the Italian public, disillusioned with politicians and bureaucrats. This, however, had some issues. As Netlau put it, quote, The people, betrayed by one generation after the other of rising politicians, are really on the lookout for honest men, and Malatesta's name and popularity had grown immensely during his long absence before his returns both in 1913 and 1919. He's no longer the isolated young anarchist. He's the man of whom all who are not narrow sectarians expect great things, miracles almost, as they were expected of Garibaldi. It is not Malatesta's fault that these hopes are not realized. No one would clearer expose than he that his solitary will alone is nothing, that the own will of the people themselves is everything. But this is not sufficiently understood. How could this be when all popular movements are, for generations now, in the hands of leaders and leaders again who are but substitutes of the old spiritual leadership of the church and of the material domination by the state? So, while there will be no miracles under Malatesta's direction, he will provide a strong rallying symbol for all the anarchists in Italy, and in 1913, he would have a chance to return once more. Cesaria Giostinelli, an old and trustworthy comrade of Malatesta, remained in Italy. He had the idea of once more creating a paper in Ancona, one to reunify the dispersed anarchist forces of Italy. Malatesta agreed, and with all of his preparations out of the way, he returned to Italy in 1913. Giostinelli began the publication of Volanta in June, shortly before Malatesta's arrival. Fabri was tasked with writing a quick circular to announce the paper's creation, and with enthusiasm, it spread throughout Italy. Malatesta arrived shortly thereafter, hopping on board immediately. Malatesta was enthusiastic about the paper, believing it would be a, quote, good cover for more practical work. The anarchists had a few months to get the paper off the ground, where it spread quite rapidly like usual. The anarchists had no shortage of good material to cover. The Tripolitanian War provided a constant source of criticism against the Italian government, and a nationwide election was being held in August of 1913. This gave them even more of an opportunity to begin a fierce anti-electioneering campaign. He began work on other projects besides the paper, publishing pamphlets of his own and adding a few more chapters to At the Cafe, a pretty good dialogue that he started back in 1897 and wouldn't be finished until much later. As the movement got off the ground, Malatesta began going on speaking tours throughout the country. He went to Milan, Rome, Florence, Bologna, and many more cities to spread the anarchist ideas as far and wide as possible. He didn't, however, just limit himself to already anarchist locations. According to Fabri, quote, As a journalist, he attended wherever popular and proletariat forces met a gathering of ex-internationalists in Imola, the Socialist Congress of Ancana, a Republican one in Bologna, and a meeting of syndicalists in Milan, etc. And on those occasions, he studied which elements would be most inclined to a serious movement. He was partial to the work of the Italian Syndical Union, which was founded shortly before and seemed to be the most opportune for his intentions and closest by the participation that some anarchists had in it. He personally intervened, though not as an official delegate, in the Syndical Congress of Milan, and was invited to speak in a session on the margin of the Congress's ordinary sessions. At the Republican Congress in May of 1914, he was called to the platform after the session's conclusion and delivered a revolutionary and anti-monarchist discourse that excited those present. He heatedly participated in the anti-militarist agitation for the liberation of Augusto Massetti, and on and on like this. <laughs> 
Essentially, he was trying to get the anarchist message heard even in areas that were typically not keen to listen. However, in one dark instance, this led him to a discussion with a figure that would lead to the suffering of thousands and would profoundly affect Malatesta's later life. Avanti, at the time, was the leading general socialist paper in Italy. It had been around for a while, but a twisted man had become its editor. That man was Benito Mussolini. While none could know what his later actions would be, the seeds of cruelty were visible enough here. Malatesta, seeking to convert some of the wider socialist movement to anarchism, accepted a few interviews. He initially was hopeful that the paper's large platform could in some way contribute to the movement, but as the interviews went on, it became clear that its editor was much more insidious. As Fabry says, quote, he didn't fool himself for long. One May night in 1914, during the Cynical Congress in Milan, the two of us went to a meeting with Mussolini at the Avanti. They spoke at length, and I listened. Malatesta entreated Mussolini to explain his position on the argument for a possible Italian insurrection, but he didn't manage to extract a single word from him indicating a precise will. The director of Avanti was totally dominated by his aversion to the reformists, entirely internal and partisan, and he showed great distrust and hatred to the syndicalists and republicans. He was sick to death of the House of Savoy, with the generals, with Giolitti, and so on, but as to the revolution itself, he showed a superhuman skepticism, and shot flames against the mentality of 1848. Upon leaving and already on the stairs, referring to Mussolini's off-handed judgment of Giolitti Barney and Libero Tancredi, who he called hypercritical and nothing more, Malatesta told me, quote, Did you catch that? He called Barney and Tancredi hypercritical, but he is the one who is hypercritical and nothing more. This man is a revolutionary only in the paper. I want nothing to do with him. Malatesta distanced himself from Mussolini earlier than most. The wider Socialist Party would later do the same, though arguably a bit too late. Though it was unknown to them, the civil interaction created a growing and ominous cloud over Italy's future, one that Malatesta would later do his best to combat directly. However, that is still to come. After almost exactly a year since his arrival, an event would take place that Malatesta had been waiting for. The Italian socialist movement had been steadily growing, and by now, the pent-up tension had finally reached its boiling point. The final straw was the killing of three anti-militant protesters, unleashing a wave of action across Italy. On June 7th, strikes and riots broke out throughout multiple provinces, with Ancona being the center for it all. A general strike was proclaimed, and the police were expelled from the city. The movement spread like a burning flame all throughout the region. Trains stopped running, rail lines were cut, armed men took to the streets, and the red flag was hoisted throughout the provinces. Malatesta didn't just relegate himself to idly watching, and instead took a direct part in the movement. In one brazen instance, a bag of explosives needed to be transported. So, the 60-year-old Malatesta took the bag of explosives and in plain daylight carried it across the city. When a friend later asked why he did this, he responded, quote, because I didn't have the time to call upon more appropriate people, and I wanted to prepare things so that it wouldn't occur to someone to use it prematurely for another act, which would have ruined all of our more urgent work at the time. This continued for seven days, though the Italian Syndicalist Union faltered at the final minute. Fearing government retaliation, they called off the general strike. This left the strikers in Ancona and the surrounding regions completely isolated, allowing the Italian government to react. They approved emergency measures, before sending 100,000 soldiers to quell the uprisings. On June 14th, what later became known as Red Week was over. The hope of a revolution had been dashed, and due to his involvement, Malatesta realized he couldn't stay in Ancona for long. Still, he didn't lose hope. He prepared an article titled, And Now, detailing what to do going forward, and left it behind to be published. The police went to arrest him, but he had already left. This is going to be kind of a break in the tone, but the way Fabry describes Malatesta's disguise is kind of hilarious. 
So we arrived in the south in a friend's car where, quote, he had simply put on a fashionable windbreaker over his clothing and had shaved. So, Malatest in a super snazzy outfit got a train in Milan all the way to the Swiss border. No one noticed him, undoubtedly due to how fashionable and sharp he was. Though, let's be honest, Malatesta is always fashionable. Anyway, he made his way back to London. He published a letter to his friends saying that he arrived safely and went back to his life in exile. He began to take up his usual life in exile, working as a mechanic and searching for opportunities to spread anarchism. However, these efforts would be nearly shattered by a few major events. The first, and most bombastic, was the Great War. The entire continent was consumed in a flurry of nationalist nonsense. His own country was dragged into the war through the vile hands of militarists, and he could only stand by and watch. Letters, materials, everything was extremely hard to get through the war zones, and he was, essentially, stuck in London. Isolated and alone, he remained with the comrades in exile and his close friends of the Defendi family. But even that wouldn't last long. Emilio Defendi, his old lover from his youth, the one who housed him in exile and took great care of him when his chronic illness struck, and a great friend, fell gravely ill near the outbreak of the war. As the condition got worse and worse, Malat has stayed by her side doing all he could. In this dark time, he was surrounded by a small clique, his closest comrades, the Defendi's kids who were like his own, and his dying friend. In those dark London nights, months went by. The sickness only got more and more painful as hope slowly vanished. Malatesta stayed there until the very end. And with it, one of his closest friends was gone. Still, though devastated, he was not the only one to feel pain this great, and that's a fact he was intimately aware of. Once Amelia was gone, Malatesta focused his efforts on combating the sickening and violent war which took away so many young and innocent for the benefit of a few magnates and barons. He remained steadfast in opposition to the war, who was further insulted by the so-called socialists and even anarchists who do not hold these convictions. Thousands of socialists threw themselves in support of various sides. To this, Malatesta wasn't very surprised at. What shocked him was the anarchists. Though far, far fewer did the same, he was horrified at some who did. It wasn't just limited to the small time and the young. Old, seasoned veterans threw themselves behind some of the powers. But of all those who defected, the one that broke Malatesta the most was Kropotkin. Kropotkin publicly declared his support for the Entente powers, believing that if the Central Powers won, there would be no way to have a revolution. This sent shockwaves throughout the anarchist movement, though most were very quick to respond. Malatesta himself created an extremely succinct article about it, simply titled, Anarchists Have Forgotten Their Principles. He opens, quote, At the risk of passing as a simpleton, I confess I would never have believed it possible that socialists, even social democrats, would applaud and voluntarily take part either on the side of the Germans or on the Allies in a war like the one in its present devastating Europe. But what is there to say when the same is done by anarchists? Not numerous, it is true, but having amongst them comrades whom we love and respect most. The article itself is great, and I highly recommend you check it out but essentially it lambasts the short-sighted folly of so many socialists in supporting a war which is ultimately only for the interests of the ruling class, a war in which no matter which imperialist power you support, the lives of millions are thrown away and wasted as a result. So, Malatesta in this time where many others faltered remained steadfast in his convictions. He wasn't alone though, and in fact, much of the anarchist movement decried those who faltered in this critical moment. Many prominent anarchists, including Malatesta, Alexander Berkman, Hippolyte Havel, Emma Goldman, and dozens more, signed the anti-war manifesto in 1915, declaring their total opposition to the war. Thousands stood up against the war, to great repression. In the US, many faced the so-called Espionage and Sedition Act, used to deport and arrest any who opposed the war. Many in Italy and England were arrested on the charge of defeatism, including Luigi Fabri himself. So then, the greatest tragedy here wasn't the degradation of the anarchist movement, who as a whole remains fairly strong in their anti-war convictions. Rather, it was the stupid and unnecessary conflicts that arose with the comrades, some of whom were previously friends for decades. As for Kropotkin and Malatesta, quote, The friendship, which had lasted almost 40 years, was broken, though saving for each other regardless mutual esteem and respect. It was, he told me some years later, one of the saddest and most tragic moments of my life, that after a discussion in extreme duress, we separate as adversaries, almost as enemies. He remained in London throughout the war, always publishing anti-war material despite the censors. He tried returning to Italy during the war, but that effort failed, so instead, he waited until the dust settled. In the wake of the Russian Revolution, he, like most socialists, were initially enthusiastic, though that quickly faded when the Bolsheviks increasingly took sole control. According to Netlow, his position on the whole thing was the following. Quote, considerable numbers of people are determined to realize authoritarian communism, and thereby would strike a blow at capitalism but could not create anything efficient or permanent. Anarchists could cooperate with them for the initial overthrow of capitalism, but must then be left absolutely free to realize their own ideal. 
Malatesta foresaw that the socialist leaders would never sincerely allow this to happen. However, whatever his personal evaluations of the situation may have been, he had to respond to the calls of overwhelming intensity and enthusiasm from the rank-and-file workers, and so he returned to Italy to try to do his best with the situation as he has done so often before. He continued petitioning and petitioning the Italian government for passport, with two general amnesties wiping away any legal reason why he wouldn't be allowed in. Eventually, in 1919, with the help of the Italian Syndical Union, he was granted his passport. However, this didn't seem to do all that much, as France blocked his passage and the London authorities wouldn't let him board any ships. It seemed like he was still de facto exiled. However, he would run into luck when Captain Alfredo Giulietti of the Italian Siemens Federation collaborated to sneak him into Italy. While the captain was a Republican, he greatly respected Malatesta for his courage and determination. He arrived in Genoa shortly after, with great reception, though Malatesta was hesitant to accept the adoration. Quote, when the steamer arrived at Genoa, all ships in the port saluted, all bore repose, and the whole working population saluted Malatesta on his passage. Turin, Milan, and Bologna gave him similar receptions, and for months there was no place where he might go to where all advanced parties would not welcome him. When these days were remembered a year after, it was well exposed that many had believed or hoped that a chief, a savior and a liberator would return in his person, and I may perhaps express this in the way that the old Garibaldi legend in the recent cult of Lenin had mixed in popular conscience and expected to find in Malatesta the socialist Garibaldi or the Italian Lenin. This misunderstanding, the fruit of the worship of authority by all advanced parties anarchists accepted, is tragic indeed. Malatesta was ready for any sacrifice, only he would not grasp at power. Dictatorship might lie at his feet and he would not pick it up, and the people, waiting for a signal, an order that would and could not come, are thus doing nothing but cheer and go home again. Though Malatesta had thousands adoring him, he wasn't willing to abuse that power. Instead, he did what he always did. He set up a paper called the Manetta Nova and picked up where he left off. It would quickly grow to become one of the most successful papers since the initial days of La Question Social and one of the largest anarchist papers in general. Post war Italy was a turbulent time. All sorts of groups vied for control, but Malatesta had the hope that in this tumult, true change would be possible. Close to his arrival, he held a speech with Luigi Galliani, who had also just arrived back in Italy. He held speeches all throughout Italy, traveling to Ancona, Turin, Milan, Rome, and much, much more. He was determined to use his opportunity to its absolute limit, and not waste a single second. Quote, If we let the favorable moment pass, we will have to pay later in tears of blood for the fear that we now infuse the bourgeois with. In a local paper in Milan, they said of Malatesta, quote, The anarchist Malatesta is for now one of the greatest figures of Italian life. The city crowds run to meet him, and they don't hand him the keys to the doors that they used to do in another time, only because there aren't keys and there aren't doors. Eventually, though, he recognized that all the fanfare was a bit too much. He made a quick letter in the paper. In it, he said, quote, Thank you, but enough. Hyperbole is a rhetorical form which shouldn't be abused, and exalting a man is politically dangerous and morally unhealthy for the exalted and those doing the exalting. This fervor surprised even Malatesta. He initially came to Italy with a different plan, believing that it was first necessary to slowly build communities, relations, and deepen the bonds between the workers. He thought that this would take some time, and like always, believed that this type of organization was a prerequisite to any serious action. However, he came to realize that a lot of this was already in place. In a letter to Fabri, quote, It's impossible to follow that road. I didn't think I would find it boiling like this. It already isn't a matter of preparing the terrain, it's ready. It's precisely, instead, to make what we can as soon as possible, because the revolution is already underway, much closer than I thought writing you from London. The Italian government saw this fervor, and at the height of his popularity, about two months after he returned, they tried to arrest him. Almost immediately, dozens of strikes and protests broke out for the old anarchist, and he had to be released. He continued his work, expanding La Humanita Nova to Bolan, where he would stay for some time. Despite this, he made every effort to appear all throughout Italy to aid his comrades, wherever necessary. However, his eagerness was often taken advantage of. Quote, Ever his presence gave rise to imposing demonstrations, often tumultuous. It should be said that his condescension was much abused, robbing him therefore of the time to accomplish more positive work that only he would be able to do. He was called to a city for a day. He arrived and found that tasks had been prepared for him for a whole week. The assemblies and gatherings were convened for all of the province, with theaters and paid halls and so on. And Malatesta, seeing the sacrifices already made by the comrades, didn't know how to refuse and stayed there. Everybody wanted Malatesta, and it eventually became clear that there was more meetings to be held than time in the day. 
A further complication was the police. They by now realized that any obvious attempt to persecute him would result in massive outrage, so they instead tried to provoke his allies into striking first, giving them a justification to react. At some points, they even tried assassinating him, with the police accidentally opening fire on multiple buildings he was in. In one particular instance, a squadron of police entered a theater Malatesta was using to hold a speech. They claimed to be securing the building, though it was obvious that they were trying to provoke the anarchists into attacking them. Malatesta noticed this, and as the crowd got more and more annoyed, he said, quote, Leave them in peace, I will speak for them as well. Then, he stopped what he was talking about to address the police directly. Fabry gives an account of the event. Quote, he began to speak of the miserable conditions of the peasant families in southern Italy, from which the majority of soldiers and police agents have been recruited through the pressure of hunger. He evokes sad figures of distant mothers who wait for help and for news of their sons, whose danger they can vaguely sense. Later, he came to speak of other working mothers in the more developed cities, also trembling that they might not see their own children or turn home after going to a meeting or a demonstration. A shiver passed through the room, of the two agonies which were rooted in the single and only note of discarded humanity. In the silence, the listeners paled, their hatred gone. The soldiers appeared the palest of them all, and in their eyes one could read what might have been an entirely new feeling for those souls. The lieutenant at once made a curt gesture to his troops, and in file they turned their back on the order's balcony, marching out in a hurry. The impression that Malatesta's words had made on his men convinced the lieutenant that it was more prudent to leave and allow the meeting to proceed without any protection. This is something Malatesta does a lot. He never acts brazenly or violently, even when provoked. He always remains clear, kind, and sympathetic without diluting his clear calls for revolution and liberation. He doesn't just preach to the converted, but also doesn't temper his beliefs to appeal to the rest. Instead, he explains with clarity and consideration open reasons why he supports what he supports. And more than anything else, he backs them up with not just words, but actions. Speaking of actions, let's look at what's going on in Italy. The Italian Syndical Union was a rapidly growing force in the Italian labor movement, spreading more and more in the wake of World War I, grew to a massive size in the early 20s. Even though, as I said before, Malatesta was extremely skeptical towards syndicalism, he still worked enthusiastically with the union. He argued against the usual anti-organization lists, and while making it again clear that a union alone can't make a revolution, he believed that if the anarchists ignored the union entirely, it would do great harm to their cause. He believed that Italy was close enough to a revolution that any sectarian actions would cause the anarchists to immediately lose the initiative. The army mutiny in June of 1920 was already a major blow to the government, but an even greater opportunity presented itself in September. In Milan, dozens of factories were occupied by their workers. It initially seemed like an isolated phenomenon, but began to spread all throughout the region. Malatesta didn't waste any time. He went to the occupied regions and met with local comrades, and above all else, urged action in this rare opportunity. However, like in Ancona nearly six years before, some socialists grew scared at the final moment. They urged limiting the occupation or even ending them completely, fearing the government's response. Malatesta worked to oppose these forces, knowing that if they stood down in this decisive moment, all would be lost. He tried to galvanize the radical factions of the Italian Syndical Union, which had some effect but not enough. The General Confederation of Labor, which was largely made up of social democrats and moderates, spent precious time deliberating, time which they would not get back. He fought as ferociously as possible, using every newspaper and outlet as possible to urge the absolute necessity of action. He and his comrades fought fiercely to not let the moment be wasted, knowing the severe consequences that would follow. They fought valiantly, and with conviction, but ultimately, it was in vain. Eventually, the government introduced some minor reforms to satisfy them, reforms which the moderates welcomed with open arms. The Maltese immediately realized how insidious this was. 
While some were celebrating the reforms, think that the government suddenly decided to care about the workers, Malatesta saw it for what it was, a distraction. He knew that those in charge would seek revenge. By giving up the initiative, the elite were now in a position to furiously strike back. Quote, in all of Italy, the proletariat beat a retreat and began to lose heart. The uncertainty and disillusion began among the masses. The general enthusiasm was extinguished and the will to fight remained in the most restricted revolutionary minorities that the government managed to quickly isolate. The bourgeois came to rear its head and it crossed from the defensive to the offensive. They would never truly get an opportunity like that again. The window had slipped. The reaction was swift as well. With the labor movement divided, the government sought revenge against its most steadfast opponents. On October 17, 1920, they moved to arrest Malatesta and raid the office of Humanita Nova. Dozens of anarchist agitators were arrested all throughout the country. Enough were released that the Humanita Nova could continue limited publication, but Malatesta and others remained in jail. The various socialist unions and groups expressed outrage at the arrests, but did nothing. The outrage eventually slipped into jaded cynicism, with Avanti calling the arrest a quote transitory episode, claiming that nothing could be done about it. The cold reaction only furthered the government's bloodlust, and the anarchists were left on their own. Speaking of Avanti, their old director is now rampaging the streets with his fascist thugs. The Blackshirts began organizing all throughout Italy, and Mussolini's fascists went on the campaigns rampaging socialists, labor activists, and pretty much everybody. The government was of course quick to respond to anarchist newspapers popping up, but did absolutely nothing as Mussolini's thugs savagely beat people in broad daylight. Malatesta and others resorted to a hunger strike until the government said what they were even being charged with, but now in his 60s, this took a great toll on his health. It began to seem like he was in serious risk of death, and Umayyad the Nova released urgent cries for aid. Some spontaneous protests broke out for the old revolutionary, but the whole socialist movement seemingly paralyzed they quickly faded. The offices of Umayyad the Nova themselves were raided by the fascists, though despite them breaking everything, the paper reopened only a few months later. The hopeful, albeit chaotic enthusiasm that filled the early years was gone, and its place a vile specter of violence and hate spread across the country. Fear paralyzed action, and the government watched on with satisfaction as those who plagued them so much in the past were now being savagely attacked in the streets. The government, in all truth, did less than nothing to stop the fascist threats. They were collaborators before Mussolini even took power. In public, they might have spouted the occasional and sanctimonious declarations against the fascist violence, but really, they watched on with satisfaction. Where was Kropotkin, Pietro Gori, the old Costa, Gaffiero, Bakunin? In those days, hope was in the air, the movement was fresh, everything seemed possible. But now, they were all gone. However, even in this time of despair, Malatesta didn't fall into a nostalgic longing for what was. Simply put, he couldn't afford it. So instead, with his trial approaching, he remained steadfast as always. He was brought to trial in July of 1921, facing numerous and vague charges. Amongst those defending him was his longtime friend, Savrio Merlino. Despite him not being an active part of the movement for decades, he wouldn't let his old friend down. So Malatesta faced the courts, who had such a laughably stupid case that any chance of a conviction was almost absent. They, in fact, didn't even really know what they were claiming he did, even during the trial. It became clear that there wasn't much time to go on long propaganda speeches throughout the trial like he did in the trials before. Mostly because the trial was clearly not going to last very long. It seems like they never even really had the intention of convicting him. Instead, they simply wanted to waste months of his time in prison before the trial, hoping that the old man would finally give out. But even in his late 60s, he continued to fight on. And while he wouldn't be able to go on any long speeches, he wouldn't miss his opportunity to highlight the hypocrisy of the situation. The trial only lasted two days, from the 27th to the 29th. At the end of the trial, he made a final declaration to the jury, one which Nello concludes with and I will read in its entirety. Quote, Gentlemen of the court, gentlemen of the jury, trials have always been one of the best means of propaganda and the doc has been the most efficient and, permit me to say it, one of the most glories of our platforms. 
I should therefore not have lost the occasion to place before you a large exposition of the anarchist program, maybe in the hope to convert one of you or yourselves to anarchism, encouraging this by what happened to me at the trial at Tronley in 1875, where eleven of the jury not only acquitted me, but came immediately to inscribe their names in the ranks of the International Workingmen's Association. But what shall I do? The public prosecutor, to whom I present my thanks and certify my admiration, did me a bad service. He cut the grass from underneath my feet. As matters stand now, if I made a great speech before you, I should resemble that old knight who coated in steel, put on his best cuirass, lowered his ventail, and jumped on the most fiery of his battle horses to ride onto the market to buy a pound of radishes. As a result, I will say nothing further. I will only profit of the occasion to weigh something not in our interests, not in that of our comrades, but in the interest of the community, in the interest of that Italy which we are accused of not loving, only because we wish that love to be on terms of brotherhood with all other nations, only because besides loving the people of Italy, we love the people of all mankind, an internationalist and cosmopolitan conception which, by the way, was at one time admitted and felt by all the fighters, all the heroes, all the martyrs of the Italian resurrection, who had overcome the limited idea of their native country and rushed into all parts of the globe to shed their blood in the battlefields where a banner of freedom was raised. You know that in Italy at this moment there was a war being waged, which by a singularity of our language is called a civil war, precisely because it is uncivil and savage. In Italy, the situation is such that we are returning to the dark and bloody night of the Middle Ages. Italy is full of mourning. Mothers, daughters, and wives are wailing and why? Over a struggle without aim. You know that I am a revolutionary. I am for insurrection. I am also for violence when violence can serve a good cause. But blind violence, stupid violence, ferocious violence, which today affects Italy. Well, this is the sort of violence which must disappear. Otherwise, Italy will cease to be a civilized nation. Gentlemen of the jury, you will give your verdict as your conscience will dictate to you. To me, it does not matter much. I am too hardened in the revolutionary struggle to be impressioned by a little prison. If you bring in a verdict of guilt, I should say that you have committed a judicial error, but I should not think you have consciously committed a deliberate act of injustice. I should hold you in the same esteem, because I should be sure that your conscience dictated the verdict. But I am an optimist. I do not think that there are men who do evil for evil's sake, or if there exists such a man, he belongs more to the specialist in insanity than to the judge in criminal matters. But all the same, all do not think like myself. If you give a verdict of guilty, our friends, by party spirit, by over great affection, would interpret this as a class verdict, would interpret it as a deliberate injustice, and you would have sown a new seed of hatred and rancor. Do not do this. This civil struggle is repugnant to all. It is repugnant to all by their elementary sense of common humanity, and it is nobody of any use to none of their classes and parties. It is not of any use to the employers, the capitalists who need order for their industries and trade, it is not of any use to the proletarians who must work in order to live and who must prepare themselves for the elevation by practical experience and solidarity. It is not of any use to the conservatives who wish to conserve something else than ferocious massacre. And it is of no use either to us who shall know how to found upon the present hatred a harmonious society, a society of free men, the condition and guarantee of which shall be toleration, the respect of honestly professed opinions. Send us home. Clamorous applause was quickly repressed by the presiding judge. Nello's biography was written during Malatus' life, with his trial being its conclusion, and as such, Fabio will lead us the rest of the way. Malatesta had missed months and months of action during his towering prison, time which he wouldn't be able to get back. Fascism had spread more and more across Italy, criminally aided by the government who would rather see the people beaten in chains than risk losing their position of dominance. He joined with all of the forces resisting fascism, the socialists, communists, republicans, what have you, but it was ultimately not enough. Umanita Nova continued their publication, but were de facto stopped by various fascist paramilitaries and government censorship. Its offices were raided, its subscribers were brutally beaten in the streets, and it became increasingly clear that the environment in Italy was reaching a new low of viciousness. Adio, compagni, adio. Malatesta had a quick respite in September of 1922. It was the anniversary of that fateful congress in saint Amir, exactly 50 years before. He and other anarchists held a reunion there, commemorating the occasion. Just like always, he didn't let him his exile from 1879, which was still in effect, get in his way. He slipped past the authorities and arrived at the same spot he did so long ago. 
Once the youngest member in attendance, at 70, he was now the last of the original delegates left. The Barlanota, Bakunin's villa financed by Cafiero, had passed through many hands by now. Almost all from that time were gone. He stayed for two days with the other comrades in attendance. They discussed some practical matters of what to do going forward and enjoyed a rare moment of peace. He returned to Rome where he was living with his close friend Elena Melli. Malatesta remained optimistic for Italy's future, though this optimism would slowly fade. A month after his return, the fascists marched on Rome. The government did less than nothing, legitimizing their thuggish takeover. The Prime Minister, for his part, said that the government should use emergency powers to quell the insurrection, and the King, for his part, overruled him and forced him to resign. With this, Mussolini was now the Prime Minister. Malatesta remained in triumphant defiance, but they quickly repressed his paper before outright banning it in December. After three years of working for Umanita Nova, he returned to the profession he had worked for decades before. He set up a small mechanic shop in Rome, working as a manual laborer despite nearing 70 years old. He lived with Elena Melli and her daughter Gemma, who Fabri says he adored like his own. Despite this meager situation, he never lost hope. He continued at any free time possible to write and contact comrades abroad. While many others like Fabri began to flee Italy to escape the fascist persecution, Malatesta stayed to make some sort of stand, though he'd later acknowledge it was mostly in vain. Interestingly, among the few who stayed in Italy was Savrio Merlino, his old friend from so long ago. In 1923, he turned 70. There was an outpouring of international sympathy for the old anarchist, though in Italy these displays were limited to his close friends and family. Still, his comrades got together enough funds to create a new paper, Volanta. During their consolidation of power, the fascists still operated under the guise of free press, a relic of the constitution. As such, they couldn't immediately shut it down. Volanta would represent this last ember of freedom, carrying it on with the clarity and thought usual to Malatesta's newspapers. It operated freely for six months before government censorship was put into place. It continued for some time, though it became more and more infrequent due to multiple seizures and police monitoring of the subscribers. Its last issue would appear in October of 1926. After this, all guise of liberty was lost. By this time, Malatesta's old age combined with the fact that most avoided him to escape government persecution meant that he couldn't continue his work as a mechanic. Instead, he had to rely on the aid of his comrades both domestically and abroad, something which he did his best to avoid until he was left with no other choice. His freedom was taken from around him, and he was gradually isolated from the world. According to Fabri, quote, a prisoner he was, truly despite all appearances, since fascism little by little isolated him and plain room from all contact with the surrounding world. More than once the comrades near and distant advised him to flee, but he didn't want to. Since the beginning of November 1926, all freedom had been suppressed, the government adopting the most draconian means and the bloodiest persecution against all free men and enemies of fascism. The excess of Italians who felt the most menace had intensified, or for who the Italian atmosphere was the most unbearable. For a certain time, Malatesta was allowed to leave and the opportunity of escape was offered to him by Swiss and French friends, but he preferred to stay, though he advised others to leave. It was just that he wanted to set an example of resistance to the rest, to look forward to the occasion of action impossible from far away, to do what little could be done, to remaining in a condition to stay informed of the events that would be decided from one moment to the next, and so on. Later, though, especially when the Spanish Revolution took place, he wanted to depart, but then, it was too late. Through the end of 1926, the persecutions against him, although in a simulated and hypocritical form, grew progressively. Already, by September 1926, after Gino Lucchetti's attempt against Mussolini, he had been arrested and held in prison for 12 days. After the other assassination attempt of Zamboni in Bologna, he had escaped arrest only by hiding himself for several days. But at the end of the year, after the flight of Dorati from Italy and more still through mid-1927, after the clandestine exit of other people who were known to be his friends, the vigilance against him intensified until it was literally asphyxiating, and furthermore dangerous for all those who came near him. They didn't stoop to imprisoning him, lacking all visible pretext for that, and on account of his age, those older than 70 typically weren't sent to confinement, and fascism feared the enormous repercussion that his arrest would have outside of Italy, and maybe the spirit of retaliation that the deed would have raised among his comrades. It was preferred instead to have him as a hostage, in a type of house confinement, surrounding him with an impassable barrier of police. Starting in 1927, the bars tightened even further. Police were stationed outside of his door, and all who entered were monitored and harassed. They followed behind him when he left his house, and stooped as low to harass his de facto family, Lena and especially Gemma. While Gemma was still a student, the police would wait outside of her university halls and lecture halls, monitoring all of her friends and acquaintances. In one instance, Malatesta wanted to meet one of the professors who Gemma spoke very highly of, 
This resulted in the professor being reprimanded by the university and interrogated by the police. At one particularly vicious instance, Gemma protested to the police following her what they were harassing her friends from school for. The police officer responded by throwing a chair at Gemma, greatly injuring her. Malathus was heartbroken over all of this. He was always sociable and defiant, thriving off his comrades whom he deeply loved. However, it became clear that even getting close to those he loved caused them great harm and suffering, forcing him to seclude himself for their own safety. Quote, those who know the sociable and affectionate nature of Malatesta will understand the emotional suffering brought about by isolation, and even worse than the isolation, the constant danger of bringing harm and misery to those who are driven by his affection to approach him. It was he himself, for the most part, who since the first moment told all of his friends to abstain from visiting him to avoid disagreeable irritation. When he saw on the street some friend or acquaintance in the distance who looked like they would approach him, he winked and made signs to the incautious person to pass him without a word, lest they fall into the hands of the police who followed him. His letters were also intercepted and searched through, with the goal of limiting the amount of money coming to him and isolating him from his friends and comrades. He began instructing all who wrote to him to quote, only write what they would be able to write to a person in jail. Despite this, he still managed to get out some text through the censorship, using Esperanto codes which avoiding particularly delicate subjects. As late as 1930, texts slipped out, though these were infrequent and monitored. However, there was also an increasing number of more serious acts against him. In 1928, after a bomb went off in the area where Elena Mella used to live, she was arrested for two months without any questioning or explanation. She was eventually released, as the only motive was to further torment Malatesta and his family. Malatesta's health, which was always tenuous even in his childhood, began to decline more and more. He suffered a severe bronchial attack, with his doctor recommending that he take some time by the sea to recover. However, any leftists who entered the town he was staying at were subject to questioning, and friends who met Malatesta were beaten by the police afterwards. As a result, he returned to Rome almost immediately. Another time, Malatus was visiting Gemma and Taracina. In a particularly repugnant incident, the police violently threatened and intimidated a 14-year-old girl and her family who had met Gemma on the beach. As a result, he once again returned to Rome. During this time, Fabi wrote to Malatus from exile, expressing his regret for abandoning Italy instead of staying to resist. However, quote, Malatus responded that he had made a mistake and that he was convinced that his sacrifice to remain there had been useless. It had become unbearable for him to live that way, to be a type of bait for the police, who would lay in waiting with the aim of catching and putting under their power those who showed affection or interest in him, humiliated him, and made him suffer. More than once he told me and wrote that he preferred the confinement of jail a thousand more times than the liberty of his, false and hypocritical. <laughs> He continued to, though tormented, do his best to contribute. He was particularly pained at his inability to help the Spanish revolutionaries, something he believed had great potential ever since Bakunin first spoke with him and Gafierlo about it all the way back in 1873. He said, quote, I have a fever. Don't be alarmed, I speak metaphorically, for the events of Spain. It appears to me that the situation presents great possibilities, and I would like to go there. I am infuriated to be here, enchained. Despite his attempts at fleeing Italy being repeatedly thwarted, he never let himself fall into despair and inaction. He did all he possibly could, sneaking out as many pamphlets and articles as possible under the severe scrutiny. Even as he lay battered and beaten, he remained steadfast, albeit increasingly exhausted. He had a serious attack in 1931, one which would take months to recover from. Quote, the next summer, he who had never suffered from the heat, even enjoying it when others found it unbearable, for the first time felt himself exhausted by it. His sickness contributed to dishearten him that summer and in the autumn, on two occasions, and seriously, from his partner, having tried as hard as she could to help him day and night. Winter wasn't much better. He wrote in a short letter to Fabry, quote, One freezes here, literally and figuratively, and I am frozen up outside and within. He waited for the spring to come, hoping to rejuvenate his health and allow him to continue his efforts. He briefly recovered, but relapsed once again when in late March of 1932, he suffered from another severe attack. Now nearly 79 years old, many both close to him and abroad feared for his health. He wrote a letter to Fabry, who was sick himself, saying that he was feeling better and not to worry about him. He said similar things to other comrades, hoping to cheer them up and keep them focused on the movement. However, as Fabry points out, he is much worse off than he let on. He wrote on June 30th in a letter to his close friend Luigi Bertoni, quote, I spend part of the day half sleeping as a fool, I generally can't sleep at night. And by the other half, I live in the intimate tragedy of my spirit. That is to say, I am shaken by the great affection that comrades feel for me, and at the same time tormented by the feeling of having merited it so little, and, what is much worse, by the growing awareness of already not being able to do anything in the future. Frankly, when one has dreamt and waited so, it is sad to die in the conditions in which maybe I will die, perhaps on the eve of the awaited events, 
Maybe there is no more remedy than to wait for the end, holding before my mind's eye the image of that which I have so desired and who I have so loved. In another letter to Bertoni, he wrote, quote, In relation to my health, here they make me believe that I am better, and I do not too afflict you to feign to believe it, but I know that it isn't true. It is true, however, that the good time and heat, which I so trust, still hasn't begun. There is, therefore, place to hope. During these months, Malath has it all in his power to stay at his desk. With all the will he could, he wrote letters to his friends and articles to the comrades. He would only leave the table when he was in great pain, taking time to rest in his armchair or lie down. Quote, the table represented life for him, where he was busy with his dear ideas, where he related with distant comrades, reading and rereading his letters and writing them. He always thought of his comrades and the great pain he was going to cause them. He was moved almost to tears when he imagined his most loved friends when he saw them receive the news of his death. He tried to write Fabry on July 11th, but couldn't finish the letter. His condition worsened on the 18th, but he did his best to remain strong. He hated the idea of his comrades who he loved so much, who did everything in his power to aid and care for, being left alone and saddened at his demise. Quote, however, he wasn't resigned to defeat. He couldn't be in bed save some moments, and he always stayed at the table or reposed in an armchair. He didn't lose spirit, his memory is always accurate and sure, his intelligence didn't suffer any alteration, although he slowly lost his physical powers. On the morning of July 21st, the eve of his death, he sat to eat with his family, read the papers as was his custom, and when the mail arrived, his letters were read by Elena. He spoke of politics a bit with the doctor who came to visit him. He found a way to write to his niece in Tristan and to a comrade in Paris, and noted in the paper some brief thought about society and the individual, which showed him to be in his usual lucidity of intelligence. At midday, he sat at the table, as always, and made himself eat a little. He split the rest of the day between the desk and the armchair until nine at night. Then, he laid down, to not get up again. Around 3 a.m., he suffered a dire attack, and went in and out of consciousness. Throughout the day, he was only able to communicate through the movement of his head. At noon, on July 22nd, he died. Fabri was the one who knew Malatesta, so I let him speak. Quote, Enrico Malatesta had died. Our loved comrade, the friend, the brother, the father of so many of us, the faithful defender of the proletariat, the apostle of the revolution and anarchy, had ended his long, laborious, and heroic journey. Now, he belongs to history. The funeral was rather small, as it had to be. The police circled the event and took note of everybody attending. The only flowers permitted were a small wreath from the family, which is a small note reading, quote, to Enrico Maltesta, Eduardo Antistan, Elena, and Gemma. Gemma had a bouquet of red flowers she wanted to put in his coffin, but as the procession went on, the police forbade her. Pain and saddened, she threw the flowers out of the window. The law usually allowed the procession to walk half a kilometer in the street, but the police forced those attending to get in their cars immediately after leaving the apartment. The funeral itself was short, the police flanking the whole event. Eventually, quote, Sunday at 6 in the morning, the coffin was lowered into the grave, and the common area of the poor people, amidst the dead of the people whom Malatas had fought for his whole life. The government tried to harass him even in death, though they eventually relented. Quote, Malatesta, having died as he lived, outside all religion, had been taken to the cemetery without a cross, and his relatives had given dispositions in order that crosses not be placed on his tomb. But orders from the government of Rome were exact and unbendable. A cross was placed even above the grave of the atheist anarchist. Next morning, when Elena Melli went to the cemetery, she saw the cross, went to take it immediately, but had to go declare that she had removed it as his wife. Later, Elena was called to the police for this, though they didn't bother to offend her pain with useless reproaches. Friends and comrades out the world to contribute to fund a true tomb for Maltesta. Quote, recourse has been had for the not insignificant expenses to the aid of the comrades and friends scattered throughout the world, and it has been had immediately and sufficiently. Therefore, in little more than a year, his wish and that of those who love Maltesta has been satisfied. Maltesta's tomb was found in the Campo Verano, the monumental Roman cemetery, in Division 30, third file, number 20, to the left of the broken column, beyond the ossuary. It is very simple, a rectangular stone lightly inclined, with his first and last name in letters, 11 centimeters high, date of birth and death in 4 centimeter letters, and a flower pot with a smelted photograph encased. I'm having trouble ending this video, which at this point I spent nearly half a year working on. Upon reaching Malatesta's death, I feel almost saddened, but the knowledge that everyone in the story has been dead for nearly a hundred years now leaves me in this weird daze. But I do think I have some conclusions. Rather than falling into sentimentality, useless nostalgia over a time irretrievably gone, 
we need to work to make things better here and now. As Malathesta ages, and his writings become less and less applicable, there is one thing that never changes. His steadfast love for humanity and commitment to real actions which should guide us more than a theoretical position. There is much to be done, and we are the only ones who can do it. The anarchist movement may be weaker than ever, but that only presents an opportunity to start again more fresh and more radical than ever before. We cannot fall to pessimism, no matter how warranted, because that is simply surrender. We have to continue. We have to fight on because if we don't, nobody else will. We have to keep on fighting for that beautiful spirit of humanity, and always against those cruel tyrants who wish to keep us down. So long as there are still those who truly believe a better world is possible, and are willing not to just idly resist but actively fight for it, anarchism will survive. So to any of you listening, I wish you the best of luck. I hope to see you again, and I hope you will continue to fight on. But for now, farewell. <laughs>